Hey everyone, good morning. Welcome to APU Postgraduate Webinar. My name is Regine and I'm your host today for this session. We are having postgraduate open day today and tomorrow, starting from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Feel free to reach out to us for any questions you have about postgraduate studies and our counselors are ready to guide you through all the options that are available for you. There are a total of four webinars today and two webinars tomorrow, which covering different topics. Do check out the topics on our website, Facebook, and YouTube channel. All right, and our first topic today is why postgraduate matters, future skills, and future jobs. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for this session, Professor T.S. Dr. Murali Rahman, Deputy Vice Chancellor of APU. Professor Murali is Road Scholar and Fulbright Fellow. He's a certified NLP practitioner and HDDF certified trainer. He has published more than 85 papers in international journals, conferences, and book chapters. He has also worked uh, in a corporate sector with Maybank and Accenture Consulting before joining the academia. He's going to share with you today how the industries are changing, how postgraduate programs can play a role in individuals as a part of embracing the changes in the world today and beyond. Let's welcome Professor Murali. Thank you, uh, Regine. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you, Prof. Thank you very much. Very good morning. Thank you for the introduction. How is everyone doing today? Hope that the listeners online are uh, fine. You've probably had your coffee or your tea and you're relaxed and you are able to listen to this review yeah so uh, I have a set of slides that I will use to sort of guide my thought process and uh, hopefully I finish in about say 35 40 minutes and probably take on questions that you might have from the floor from the audience yeah so if uh, the crew can bring up the slides for me thank you great as you as you can see I'll be looking at uh, postgraduate programs in light of changes that are happening around the world. So it's called future skills role of postgraduate program. So as, as you know, the world that we are living in today is changing very, very fast. Yeah, it's extremely fast. Um, we are living in something called the WUKA world. And, and what is this WUKA world? Probably spend a few minutes, maybe first 10 minutes talking about what the WUKA world is. So this is actually a picture of a person who is on a treadmill in a echocardiograph 
machine yeah it's a ecg stress test machine so normally when you go for your heart check or your annual review of your medical health they do a stress test on you so usually if you want to check your heart as well so what they do is they attach some of you might be familiar with this some of you probably new to this yeah so they, they'll attach your uh your chest to wires which is connected to computers of course and they put you on this treadmill and you start walking and then they increase the gradient they increase the speed and then they run the to, to see they run the test to see if you're coping well if your heart is stressed so this is the reading of a normal person as so if you see even if they are uh, on a treadmill the the graph reads very very systematically so it's consistent so likewise on that same note if you use this analogy of consistency in a normal world the world wasn't stressed before if you look at 20 30 40 years ago we were not really stressed out in the world the economy was pretty much stable uh finances was very stable relatively things were going on smooth just like the graph of a health and fit person but today unfortunately um my fellow listeners you'll find that we are living in this sort of heart condition it's very erratic this is called an ischemic heart reading so it's not consistent it's very volatile and it totally changes it totally changes it changes you know in fact every other week every other month certain shocks are actually happening in the world today so it's called the wuka world it's highly highly volatile extremely volatile and the volatility is as a result of multiple factors that are simultaneously hitting the, the business uh, domain yeah, and the economy worldwide not only in malaysia but across the globe so this is the heart rate of someone who is unhealthy now so if you god forbid if you're reading is something like this we got to get it checked yeah you got to get it checked so that is why today as we speak we have to have many measures countermeasures from an economics perspective from a finance perspective regulatory perspective to look at how we cope with the shocks that's happening around the world today and uh, so this is this is the, the backdrop of an analogy that i often use so what exactly is the wuka world so we stands for volatility as i mentioned fast unpredictable changes without clear patterns or trends so as i mentioned 30 40 three or four decades ago you find that changes were pretty you can anticipate change you know weather patterns were very clear we knew exactly when it was summer we knew exactly when it was winter we knew exactly how much rainfall there would be in a year but today look at rainfall right every other week there seems to be a flash flood in kuala lumpur and this is tied to something called climate change so extreme weather patterns unpredictable and and we cannot predict anymore in a on an accurate basis so very volatile very volatile the business factor business domain the, the world today as we live in is very volatile we in wuka you uncertainty given volatility with volatility comes uncertainty what does uncertainty mean frequent disruptive changes where the past is not a very good predictor of the future so as i mentioned in the past i grew up in a very small village here it's called Kuala Pila in the Gris Milan, very small. I would know exactly uh, my father when he would go to work, when he would come back. And we didn't even look at the watch. We will know what time it was. It's just based on certain actions of people's behavior in that community that we lived in. But today, you, you can't do that anymore. It's unpredictable. When you go to work, how you go to work, what time you come back from work, many dependencies, yeah? so many dependencies in our response to that. So time becomes of an essence as well. We're very pressured. We're very stressed with times today. So volatility causes uncertainty. We cannot predict things in a certain way anymore. So with V and U comes complex. So when things are volatile, when things are uncertain, naturally they intensify the level of complexity that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. We have multiple choices, not multiple choice questions, but multiple complex intertwined issues that are hitting us on a, on a regular basis. Technology is impacting businesses and economies. Societal changes is impacting uh, businesses and, and, and communities at large in the world. Geopolitical instability is impacting us, not only in Malaysia, other parts of the world. Ecological evolution, climate change, is again impacting humanity at a, such a massive rate. Yeah? So with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, our ability to vision, our ability to strategize, our ability to put things to into clear perspective is somewhat questionable. There's nothing we can do about this. All we hope is we can have very clear plans, but you need to have contingencies as well. And there's little clarity, given these pressures that are simultaneously hitting economies and countries at large. That's VUCA in a nutshell. So in essence, at a very macro level, we're seeing a lot of changes. Right? So naturally, 
as an individual, even for me, there are certain times I question, hey, am I good enough or not? Am I competent enough to lead organizations? Am I ready to take on the academic world to the next extent? How do I cope with this pressure? So which is why that continuous upskilling, reskilling, rethinking, repositioning, unlearning, relearning, and freezing what we learn, and then again coming back, unlearning, relearning, and then uh, rethinking, that is a whole continuous process and journey, continues. So every day I'm learning something new yeah, in the world. So likewise, and before we look at postgraduate's role, something that we really have to expect and, and accept is we need that upgrade la, to ensure that we are relevant in the, in the world today because the world is moving at a such drastic speed and changes is very, very rapid. Again, to echo some of my earlier points, picture from Fukushima 2011 in Japan, tsunami, major tsunami that hit Fukushima impacted the nuclear reactors in Japan as well. And people wrote the Japanese economy out. But naturally, Japanese being resilient, they managed to bounce back. But again, now they are saying, Japan, they are also predicting that the natural disasters are only going to intensify thanks to things like climate changes I talked about. So environmental issue is becoming a key thing, which is why in our postgraduate program, we really hammer down issues related that are related to ESG. What is ESG? Environmental sustainability and governance issues this is very very important yeah when it cuts across different industry verticals banking esg key education esg key united nations 17 sustainable development goal plans all mapped to either governance issues sustainability to sustainability issues or environmental issues so time for upskilling is always a must so this is one aspect of the environment which is adding to the wuka world yeah then you have now political instability Malaysia today, hottest news, what's trending, major trend on various Twitter, Insta, uh, not so much Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and other social media channels on WhatsApp. And so major discussion, everybody's talking about this, price of chicken, chicken price, poultry, price of wheat. In fact, I went to the grocery store last night. I wanted to buy, I was just sharing this with one of my fellow colleagues. I went to the section where I thought I wanted a long time, I haven't had Horlicks, and maybe I should buy Horlicks. So I went to the... Uh, sections where they had the uh, drinks with malt and so on. So I picked up a small Holix packet, very small. Probably you can make two or three glasses. It was priced close to 11 ringgit. I took it and nicely put it on. I said, I might as well just go and have a drink of Holix. I feel like having it today and pay maybe three ringgit or 350 and, and get it done with. This is 11 ringgit for a small bag. And then I looked at the ingredients. It says wheat, main component wheat. And we know what's happening to the wheat production in the world, right, today. Logistics issues, supply chain disruptions, um, the pre uh, from pre-pandemic to pandemic now to post-pandemic endemicity. As we get to anti uh, endemicity, labor shortage is immense in the world. People haven't fully mobilized yet, even in Malaysia and other parts. So it's put a lot of pressure on manufacturing companies. They are not able to produce at the pre-pandemic levels. So as a result of that, that escalates and intensifies supply chain and logistics issues. Coupled with the fact that Russia and, and Ukraine are in conflict, again, putting major, major, major pressure on the world financial markets as well. So all these forces are hitting us at a very unprecedented, unprecedented level. This is happening at the same time. Yeah? We just feel that we've recovered from COVID and then this thing happens. Or we're recovering from COVID, this thing happens at the international level. So again, very hard to make predictions. Yeah? So that puts a lot of pressure on, on, on businesses, puts a lot of pressure on our own livelihood in our own jobs. How do we remain relevant in the company? Yeah? So how do I ensure that I can add back if I'm a corporate leader, what skills do I need to achieve? If I'm an employee, what skills do I need to have to ensure that I remain relevant in my business, in my organization? So hence, we have to think about that upskilling and reskilling process. Again, as I mentioned, COVID-19, uh, as we move from pandemic to endemicity, it also requires certain skill set changes. Yeah? So in the universities, for example, now we are students have started coming back cause the reshifting of our thought process. So likewise, I'm sure many of your companies, if your corporate people out there listening to this, you will want to ensure that you are well prepared, you know, how we move from pandemic to endemicity and what are the skill sets that I need to have to ensure that not only me as an employee, but my fellow colleagues in the organization, leadership as well, how do we make the transition smoothly into, into the normal world again, yeah, in that sense. So again, this adds to the VUCA world. And one more element in the VUCA that is really making the world a lot more complex is the role of technology and and it's timely that i speak about technology because 
Asia Pacific University is a premier university in terms of technology and innovation. Yeah? So it's in our name, it's in our brand. So we pride ourselves as unleashing state-of-the-art technologies in our labs, in our education content. We've been voted the top cybersecurity provider from an education perspective for the region yeah, in the last two years. And some of our students are award-winning, some of our staff are award-winning staff. And, and therefore, we, we really position ourselves very well to address the complexities put forth by digital disruption, which leads into the IR 4.0 sort of space. So if you walk into any, if you walk into APU campus, you will see the whole campus vibrating with this theme called IR 4.0. And how we're addressing that is very technology based. Right? So you will get that feel and sense. So the pulse is, is very, the pulse is very, very clear that here we eat, breathe, think technology and how we infuse technology, not only into our technology based program curriculum, but it's also infused into our business curriculum as well. So that's something that we really take pride of and we are doing extremely well in that space. So digital disruption is one of the major concerns for many, many, many industry leaders. So including uh, CEOs and CIOs, they come back even as I do round table discussions, I met uh, a group of board members yesterday. So we went a webinar together, short discussion. Again, they are saying that, Prof, we are not really sure how to cope with digital changes. Yeah, we're not sure. We are there, but we need to learn and again, unlearn and relearn and then implement new strategies. Yeah, we got to think along those lines. So hence, let's take a look at some of the technology side of the pressure. Some of us are very familiar with this product. Uh, when I showed this to my boys, the younger generation, 18 and 15, they call me Appa or father. I say, Appa, what is this? Is this a pencil or, a, or what? What is this? They haven't heard of this company called Kodak. Yeah? I mean, first time now they know, I shared the story with them. So this is how analog camera worked. And you need to wash this film, right? It's called washing. You wash the film. You take this thing out of a camera, analog camera, take it to a photo studio, then they will wash it and they print the picture and give it to you after three or four days. Think of how far we have come as society eh? when we look at pictures and how fast the advancement of digital technology has, has sort of led to innovation in the space of cell phones and the cell phones becoming your cameras. So even as I speak now, I can quickly do a selfie, uh, take that picture, send it across to America, somebody else there, in less than a minute, right? And, and the picture gets transmitted. And it can even be viralized if you want to. So in that sense, Things are evolved so fast right? from analog to digital. And this is something of the past. Radios of the past. We had this in my hometown, so I kept this picture. We used to listen to the radio as if we were watching television. Television wasn't existent at that time. Although we, if we had the early 70s, we couldn't afford it. Yeah, Households at large couldn't afford televisions. Radio is what we, we glorified after. We would sit down in front of the radio and listen to live commentary of football, as if we were watching it in the stadium. So these were the good old days. Yeah, Some of us may be able to relate to this. Television then came. And these are the sizes of the TVs before. They look like aquariums. Today, they have become very small, very agile, very nimble. And even, in fact, some of us don't even have TV sets anymore. Right? We are running, we are running things off our personal digital assistants, our PDAs, our laptops, our mobile, our computers, basically. So again, technology has evolved very fast. Olivetti and Kodak had a similar issue. At one point of time, Olivetti was, Olivetti was this great company. Yeah? So they dominated the, the, the industry for typewriters. So they produced typewriters. And they were the de facto leader, industry leader for the, the, the typesetting and typewriting industry. And Olivetti, with that sheer leadership and control of market share, became very arrogant. What does arrogance mean? They felt that nobody could disturb their business. And eventually, there was a little company at that time, very little, called IBM, who went to Olivetti and said, hey, Olivetti, should we get into a partnership? Because I have computing power, you have market, so let's take your strength, merge that with my strength, put that as synergistic strategy, and let's get into this business together, right? Olivetti said, thank you very much. You are no one. I'm controlling the market share. Now, today, years later, decades later, some of us don't even know hey, who is Olivetti, but we know IBM. The rest is history. The power of computers, the power of computer and technology, it's really taken the world by storm. Yeah? So, in essence, Kodak Olivetti shows that we need to change with mindset, even at the corporate level. 
Nokia is another classic example. One point of time, if you own this 3310, you were king. And you walk around with this Nokia, people respected you. You say, oh my God, you made it in life. Look at the phones today that we have, how powerful they have become. Yeah? Again, times have changed very fast. Phones have become very smart. They're becoming, they're becoming so ubiquitous that they use for multiple purposes, from e-commerce to entertainment to education to edutainment. Name it. It's, it's, it's all on the single cell phone that we actually have today, the smartphones. Yeah? So key lessons, those who are listening from this, I put the very careful process of thinking of what image I should pick. Major lessons of the past would be as follows. Yeah, some of the major lessons. I think it's pretty obvious, but it's worthwhile of sharing it. Yeah? Number one, signals have changed. At a deeper engineering sense, which we have very strong engineering programs in APU as well, including petroleum engineering and our masters and so on. Um, at the fundamental level, digital technology has caused and has led to great innovation in products and services around the world, just to the advent of digital signals. Yeah? In the olden days, there was only analog signal that were that were in use. And, and, and the advent of digital technologies, digital signal, it allows us to really rethink and redesign businesses. So at our postgraduate program, uh, we really look at the fundamental aspects of technology and how technology is leading and empowering innovation. So that's one major lesson that we learned. Lesson two, change is the only constant. From a business perspective, we cannot rest on our laurels and say, hey, I'm already a successful company. But, or I'm already in a very stable job. Nobody can shake me. Nobody can, you know, nobody can uh, what do you call, remove me from my particular seat or chair that I occupy in this organization. No, that's, that's, that's wishful thinking. Because the younger generation are coming up fast and furious. I'm not sure, fast and furious 9 or fast and furious 11 now. But <laughs> movies aside, they are coming in very fast. And they seem to know a lot more than, 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 than the, the, the more mature generation. I wanted to say older generation, that would be me as well, but more mature generation. I mean, my children know a lot more about technology than I do. My son, for example, composes his own songs, writes his own lyrics, produces his own digital music, and puts it on Spotify. And he cuts deals with record labels as well. Never went to music school. So in essence, a lot of the learning that happens now is vicarious by observation. A lot of the learning that happens now is through passion. And the challenge now for us is to really understand and ask ourselves, am I competent enough? If I'm not, if the answer is no, I'm not competent enough, and then what change should I aspire for in this life? What, where do I see myself three years, five years down the line? Am I leading companies? Am I leading academia? So therefore, the answer is yes, I want to lead, but I don't have competencies that takes me there. The time is today to make a very important decision. How do I upskill myself? What programs might be relevant for me? That's why the postgraduate, yeah? That's why we look at the postgraduate. So change is the only constant and it's only going to continuously change. So if we aspire to be a leadership and we come from very strong engineering background or technology background, then we say, hey, I might need to increase my competency in management and leadership. So can I look at certain postgraduate business programs? Or if you come from a hardcore business background, finance background, you're very strong there. And you're saying, oh my God, but technology is moving so fast. I don't know what data analytics is, what data management is, or what data science is, and how does it help me to sort of make better decisions as a leader, as I move up my company? Then let us venture into the tech side of things to upskill ourselves. So why? Change the only constant. Now that's that's it. So in essence, we have to change or be changed by market forces. This is a very, very clear message. So in essence, if we don't change, we will be forced to change by market forces. Look at what happened to codex of the world. So we cannot go through the codification process. What I mean by codification process, we cannot be like codex, once upon a time, a very good company, today no, no longer in existence. Olivetti, once upon a time, a long, long time ago, in a land far away, there lived this very powerful company called Olivetti, that was disrupted by digital disruption. So in essence, if it can happen to industries, if it can happen to companies, large-scale companies, even multinational corporations, right? Think about you and me at the individual level. Even for me, I have about nine years before I retire. Nine years. So I'm revealing my age on, in the open. So I retire nine years. What do I do after that? Would I become irrelevant? 
So how do I prepare myself for a decade from now? What sort of competencies do I need to build in the next 10 years? So the learning never stops. Just because you're a professor, you're a deputy vice chancellor, doesn't mean that I've learned enough. Doesn't mean that I should stop learning, I should stop reading, or I should stop doing research. That is something that we do on a daily basis to ensure that we became, we not only we become relevant, but we are able to impart to the younger minds out there yeah, that, that want to embrace change in a much more uh, positive way. So lesson, just take a look at the pictures that I showed. Make a firm decision in sense that I think the time is right for me to do something to upgrade myself. Then decide what domain you want to upgrade yourself in and move on accordingly. Yeah, so that's very important. Again, to really show, well, let's talk about fintech a bit. We have a master's program called Masters in uh, Fintech. This is Mona Lisa. Yeah, so Mona Lisa, if you've been to Paris, she's hosted at the Louvre Museum in France been there several times to the queue to look at Mona Lisa is very long when you go in front you look at it's very auspicious it's a very grand moment when you're in front because of the energy that we give to that painting is really live it's, she's very lively she looks alive in the painting and she's valued at 860 million US dollars yeah? post inflation that is 860 million US dollars she's valued so while we have traditional paintings out there from a financial perspective now, as the financial sector is changing, given the VUCA world that I talked about, there's an emerging industry called non-fungible tokens, so NFTs, yeah? So this is like a, an example of an NFT would be through the form, it's manifestation in art. So this is a picture by an artist called Deepal, who took images of 5,000 uh, social images over 5,000 days. It was a project that he had, compiled it, put it on digital canvas, and when that was actually auctioned, it was something along more than 60 million US dollars. I think it's something like 69 million US dollars now as we speak. So in essence, the point of this slide is, again, in light of change and transformation, there is tremendous amount of opportunities for us in the digital world. Yeah. So we really have to understand what is the world looking like currently, 2022, in terms of market offering, industry offering, spaces, changes that's happening, and project that also project that in a trajectory over the next two decades, over two decades. So if we are 24, 25, 30 today, by the time we hit 40, 45, 50, what would be the next wave of technology? How is it going to take, where people are talking about metaverse becoming a big thing. So I'm going to write about this. It will be published in press, I think, fairly soon. God willing, if everything goes well. So there, I would actually talk about how are companies having immersive experience, positioning themselves to be immersive, uh, their customers to have that immersive experience of being in this virtual world. So the internet now is evolving to become metaverse. Some would argue it's only a Facebook phenomenon, but I would argue otherwise. It does apply to many other companies. It does apply to many other industries. So in that position, you just the folks that you just the folks with the uh, with, with, with the availability of a variety of postgraduate programs. So things like fintech becomes important. Things like digital business becomes important. Things like digital leadership and strategy becomes important. So how do we plug and play into programs that offer this? So think about that. This is again just show something as traditional as art is now also gaining momentum in the, in the digital space. Bitcoin is not doing too well, but there's only one aspect of cryptocurrency as, I, as, as, as we speak. There are many other forms of crypto coins out there. Yeah? But in essence, it's predicted the value of crypto that's traded on a global basis, forget the ups and downs or the bulls and bears for the crypto industry. It's valued more than a trillion US dollars already. Yeah? Just cryptocurrencies is valued more than a trillion dollars. And certain central banks are at the brink of actually re liberalizing this. So in essence, the next three to five years is going to be very, very tricky for financial service providers as well. And for you and me as consumers, yeah, because certain countries, they are legalizing this, certain countries, they are making it mainstream of the economy, while certain countries and monetary authorities are still considering what would be next when it comes to crypto trading. But in essence, we should not be left out. We should at least make an effort to understand what is crypto, how does it work? What do we mean by mining uh, for coins? How does blockchain technology apply to this? And how do we form a strategy and build a strategy around these technology concepts if we are in an organization, whether you're working for one or whether you're running for one. So again, when we think of future skills, future jobs, am I abreast with 
changes that's actually happening around there when it comes to technology. Yeah? So another thing. Again, some pictures here. This is some very Michael Jackson in the year 1983 in the album Thriller, he won nine Grammy Awards. Very powerful, very famous icon in the pop industry till today. But for him to reach the masses took him a good year yeah, to, to actually sell a million records for, for that version of the album called Thriller because the reach was very difficult in those days. The logistics, the distribution channel was very complex in those days. They didn't have technology. Today, people like BTS, Tyler the Creator, Kendrick Lamar, uh, the various other pop artists out there. My own son, they can hit millions. My son, not millions yet. <laughs> like BTS, almost a billion downloads over 24 hours. The latest song by Sai, and he partnered with one of the BTS stars, very catchy song after Gangnam Style that came back this year, is resurfacing this year, is taking the music industry by storm, right? Overnight, overnight success, overnight branding, overnight positioning, overnight promotion, overnight market by storm, compared to Michael Jackson, who's very popular. So in essence, the platform that we are playing in now is changing. And the platform through the internet, now metaverse as we speak, is going to really allow different sort of economic um, outcomes and opportunities for people, for you and me. If you have talent, the world is at the fingertips. Yeah? Chef One, which is Nigel Ng. So Chef One made a remark when Nigel Ng interviewed him. Uncle Roger, some of you know Uncle Roger. So he told Uncle Roger, he said, Roger, you took only less than a month to hit a million people huh, who come to know you. It took me 30 years to become famous as a chef. Huh? And you got popularity by criticizing how I make fried rice, in essence. So basically, platforms such as TikTok, social media, other social media, that it's, it's really leveling the playing field. So you're not sure when someone somewhere in a land far away, in a tiny island, or in my, in my tiny kampong called Kuala Pila, would actually make it very big one day. Because we have the platform. So therefore, again, what are the uses of this platform? How do we build uh, a business around this? From a technology side, how do we support? From a process side, from, how do we support? From an innovation side, how do we so it requires rethinking. So are we skilled to do that? So we kind of say, hmm, what do I need to do? Yeah, do I need to upgrade myself again? So thinking about that. Once again, change is the only constant. Jeff Bezos says, we see our customers as invited guests to a party and we are the hosts. It's our job to make every important aspect of the customer experience a little better. So in postgraduate programs, if you're looking at more marketing, communication, these are the themes that we will be exposing all of you guys to. So it's like, how do we actually build customer story? How do we use design thinking, for example, to build a journey for the customer to ensure that we are innovating around what they think is right as consumers of products and services, not what we think is right as a company. So yeah, think about that. Bill Gates, your most unhappy customers, your greatest source of learning. How do we learn from feedback? Yeah. Um, Steve Jobs talks about data and he talked about data analytics three decades ago before people even started talking about data science, which is why he's a legend. Yeah? The late Steve Jobs, RIP, where you are, sir. Get closer than ever to your customers, so close that you tell them what they need well before they realize it themselves. So here, if you are potential customers, the audience out there, what we are telling you is we may need to equip ourselves fast la, with, with lessons and, and we need to really reskill. So think about this. Yeah. So think about it. And uh, we cannot allow ourselves to go through the codification process, meaning to say we cannot at an individual level or at the corporate level, at the leadership level, we cannot become irrelevant. Yeah, we need to think about it. These are all successful examples of companies that have really empowered themselves, they're remaining relevant through use of internet technology. Facebook bringing us internet via drones, the Grab, Uber, Saga, and how Grab is getting into multiple markets now. Uber, of course, is no longer in existence. Use of IoT, this is a farming project called Habibi Garden in Indonesia, where they use IoT sensors to sort of help farmers to improve their yields, to just ensure they manage the irrigation process, the soil conditions, the temperature for the plant. So again, all this is technology, payment system. So just by based on the slides, you really say there are different programs that we can actually look at at a postgraduate level to look at either from a research perspective or from a thought program perspective or thought master's program where you learn courses and you do a project in the end. 
along the lines of technology. Yeah, Airbnb, again, another classic example. So it's just like asking ourselves where, what we want to do next. Again, another interesting story from a banking perspective, talking about fintech again. Uh, DG Bank, a big bank a subsidiary of DBS Bank in Singapore, they launched a 90 second app downloadable. So you can open your savings account in 90 seconds. And they launched that in, in, in India. Yeah, they'd be wondering why is a Singapore bank launching a product in India, not in Singapore? Regulation comes in. So when you look at things like cyber law, cyber crime, cyber security, how does regulation fit in that space? How do I need to expose myself to this sort of discussions? Yeah. So think, think, think of think along those lines. Uh, autonomous vehicles, we're looking at autonomous vehicles now. The Prime Minister recently invited Elon Musk and Tesla to set up the operations in Malaysia and uh, sort of in addition to creating jobs, living the ESG goals as part of the UNDP's um, 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Let's see if that materializes. But in essence, the advent of self-driving cars, autonomous cars or electric cars could change industries by, by, by could take industries, could force industries to rethink yeah, their, their operations and so on. So again, these are some older products. I'm just going to go very quickly. This is a blender of the past. Today, Blender, I'm not talking about the software Blender, but this is the thing that you grind flour with. Someone, a picture of the past. My mother had this uh, at home, still there. Um, how we produce power in the past using this sort of generator and power producing machines. Yeah, very, very, very old traditional, traditional way. And that has led to industrial revolutions. When someone asks you what is an industrial revolution, we should be able to answer. But let me summarize it for you. Industrial revolution is just looking at things in two maps, two quadrants. One, you're superimposing time, which century you're in, and you look at it, that's the X axis here, and you superimpose at the backdrop of what technologies were prevalent at that time. So, for example, in the end of the 18th century, it was web. Uh, was Industry 1.0, not web, sorry, but Industry 1.0. What does that mean? It meant industries were really powered by mechanical production, uh, water and steam technology. They drove industry. They drove industry. So the second was mass production by electricity. Electricity became big. The third industrial revolution was powered by robotics, automation, population of the internet, the World Wide Web. Today, we're looking at cyber physical systems. What do you mean by cyber physical systems? Not only electricity, that's a given. Internet is a given. So a child that's born today, it's crying, not because there's no internet. The child is crying because not it doesn't want, it does not, it's supposed to be a joke. Not that it doesn't have oxygen, but it's, it's crying because he wants the device. Be the, the younger generation are hooked onto devices at such a young age. But 4.0 basically talks about cyber physical systems. Essentially, internet a given, electricity a given, automation given, uh, artificial intelligence a given. But how do I combine all of this to make very smart and digital products, yeah? So the watch is telling me I'm talking too much. The watch is telling me I need to get up and exercise. The watch is telling me my heart rate. The watch is telling me my sugar content. The watch is telling me how much calories I need to burn for today to remain fit. So that tells us this modern day world, things are becoming extremely smart. Products, processes are becoming extremely smart. In fact, smarter, than human beings, yeah? So therefore, our challenge is, how do I keep up with this change? What do I need to know to empower myself to actually understand these things better, right? So that's a very important point that you want to, but this is what I mean by cyber physical systems, the automation, the robotics technology coming, self-driving cars, uh, machine, machines that produces intelligent healthcare systems. So it combines internet, combines digital system, combines algorithm, sort of produce business cases for companies, yeah? So you need to think about those. And again, at APU, we are very proud because we look at the 4.0 imperatives from different dimensions. We look at it from an economic perspective, so postgraduate programs to look at economy, to support the IR 4.0 dimensions. We have unique technology and business programs to support the 4.0 dimensions. We have national and global issues programs that support the uh, IR 4.0 dimensions. We have issues related to psychology and society as well. Yeah, Psychology, of course, for bachelors now, hopefully coming soon to to, to your doorstep. Uh, and last but not least, we also look at embedding to all of these core produce, core programs, is how do you transform yourselves as leaders of the company. So again, we go a bit more deeper. You may say, okay, Prof, what are some of the programs that you have in relation to IR 4.0 business technology? These are, we look at robotics, simulation. These are all different things that you'll actually 
we're exposed to cybersecurity, uh, augmented reality, AR, VR, data science, data analytics, so a variety of programs. Just log into the website, look at some of the brochures that you have here on campus, and, and you'll be able to plug and play where you feel you are lacking from a competency perspective. Yeah. So what, therefore, is the role of PG programs? I've already said it in my slides, but again, to quickly recap, this is not morally saying. This is actually from the world economic forum they're saying they did a study in 2020 by 2025 this will be the top skills that people should aspire for analytical thinking and innovation active learning and learning strategies complex problem solving critical thinking and analysis creativity leadership social influence technology use monitoring and control technology design and programming resilience stress tolerance and flexibility emotional intelligence service orientation so there are 15 top skills that people are looking for by the World Economic Forum, yeah, based on surveys across different companies and different industries around the world. So they are saying that this is what skills, competencies that I need to have as an individual. Challenge, therefore, is if we have all of those, fine. But if we're saying, I think I'm good at only two of these 15. What do I need to do, therefore? What's my passion? Should I pursue a program in that sense? So that's, that's the whole purpose of this chart. So what's the role, finally, of PG programs? Provides you upskilling opportunities. What do you mean by upskilling opportunities? As I mentioned earlier, position yourself three to five years down the line. What are your aspirations? What are your career goals? If you answer that clearly, articulate it, put, put, put it down on paper, put it down in the computer and say, if this is my career aspirations three to five years down the line, am I competent? What are my skill gaps? So if I want to lead a tech startup company, for example, what does a leadership from a tech startup company mean? What competencies would that leader need to have? What sort of core domain skills that that person needs to have? Once we have that, map that to a program. If you want to be a data scientist and you already have certain basic qualification in that area, you say, I want to learn more about this. Because I think telling a story with data or data storytelling is important. I need to lead meetings and craft uh, design programs around the data that we have. And I need to work with leaders and bridge the gap between the CIO, CFO, and CEO of a company. And I'm the guy who's connecting the dots using data. Do I need to consider data science and business analytics, for example? So very easy thought process. Just ask yourself, where you position yourself? What are your gaps that you have? How are you going to bridge it to a postgraduate? Networking possibilities. So remember, when you come into programs here, of course, the last two years, people were networking online. Now we are opening up fairly fast, rapidly fast. So it's probably early next year, you will find most of our students are back on campus. It's already trickling in now. You find that that's where your networking opportunities and possibilities are there. Till this very day, I network with the people that I worked with in my MBA days, Imperial College in London. Yeah? So that network actually happens really well. You keep in touch with some of these guys. Yeah? And also, it's an opportunity for us. The PG program is a platform for us to reposition our marketability. It's your personal brand. This is telling the world, hey, I've done this and I can do more. And this is my personal brand. Yeah. And, and I'm ready to take on new challenges. It's, it's a statement that you're making with that certificate that you actually have. And with us, not only the APU certificates, some of our programs are dual awards. So you get also the De Montfort University certificate as well. Or oh, that branding comes together, together. Yeah. So I'll, I'll stop, uh, Regine, for, for questions. We have about 15 minutes more uh, to probably take questions on the floor. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Professor Morali. Now sure. that we know how crucial it is to keep up with the technology, stay relevant and stay up to date so as to accelerate your growth as a person and help you to grow your career in today's world. Now it's time for our Q&A. Everyone, please feel free to drop the questions in the comment section and we will address them accordingly. And Prof. Murari, I have some questions here. Sure. Um, what are different pathways of pursuing a postgraduate program? Okay, I think this is a very interesting question. Because as you see now, the education landscape is becoming a lot more liberal, yeah? Uh, Regine. So what do we mean by a lot more liberal? So if you take like uh, the past, when we say postgraduate programs, there's probably um, only one way of doing it. You sign up, you go to university, you sign up with a program, you study over one year or one and a half years if it's on a part-time basis. Maybe some will take two years. Um, then you get a cert at the end of it. 
That's the only way. So I finish a program, that's one. But now at APU, you have different pathways as well. You could use a micro-credential pathway, which means you, you would take some of short courses that we probably have, and that short courses can be credit transferred into a main, mainstream programs. So it's called digital badges, it's another way. And uh, we're also in the midst of looking at the FLC route, yeah? So we are almost finalizing that sort of route. So meaning to say we will credit prior experience that people are bringing in into, into their application. So let's say, Regine, if you've worked in the industry for four years, two years, three years, you've done something in the line of media communications, so if you're coming in for a media communications or a master's, we take a look at that and probably do an interview and a quick assessment of how can we credit transfer you and waive up to 30% of your of your module. So it would be an express track for someone who has that experience. So that would be another pathway. And uh, of course, the traditional track of I go to university, I sign up for a program and I graduate. So three three tracks, micro-credentialing way, the, uh, the APEL route, and last but not least, the, uh, the, the traditional part. So I hope I've answered your question, uh, the, the question from the audience, yeah. Uh, we have this question from Jervis. Why do okay. we need postgraduate programs when we can learn so many things from sources such as uh, Coursera? Okay, good question. I mean, this is like asking, why do I need to cook my own food when I get fast food, right? So <laughs> a simple analogy would be, yeah, we can learn from different sources. That sources that you learn, end of the day, many employers worldwide, not only in Malaysia, based on my experience in this field for almost 22 years now, most employers will still require a formal certificate of a, of a reputable university yeah, or academic institution of, or institution of higher learning. So they need that endorsement. So while you can do the Coursera classes, you can download that badges that you're getting fine, as I mentioned, that should fit in into one of the pathway towards postgraduate. Because end of the day, um, there are thousands and thousands of people out there as we speak who are taking some module on Coursera. But end of the day, when you're applying for jobs and you're applying for promotions, the questions that still people are asking is, hey, what's your master's uh, or, or what's your PhD uh, in? You see, and where did you get it from? So that is, still matters, uh, Jelvis, to answer your question. It still does matter, in my view, uh, and, 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 and the viewpoint of many generations, uh, not only my generation, but the generation next to me who are now in the mid-career level, they're still saying this thing. It's a it's a validation that the program that you did is powerful from a branding perspective. Somebody validates your content and you need, therefore, the postgraduate validation by a reputable institute. So that's that's my take on that question. Okay, thank you. Um, I have uh, one more question that we always receive, uh, what's the difference between PhD and DBA and how do I know which is right for me? Okay, PhD and DBA. So again, very, very interesting question. Uh, uh, Chin, Ms. Chin. So here, both, let's look at the similarities here at a practical level. Both qualification allows you to use the title doctor, correct? And that, that, that we need to be very clear with that. So DR title comes, the doctorate in something, and it's also a doctorate in administration. And when you do a philosophy, yeah, philosophical, both, both carry the title. So Dr. Regine is there, You're, whichever part you take, fine. That's the similarity. Another similarity is you are required to do research. So even PhD research, there is research component, for DBA, there's a research component, but DBA, you also have certain modules that you finish first before you do your research component. Similarities. There are certain differences. The differences is, uh, one, from a positioning perspective, yeah, most of the time people say PhD tend to be a lot more academic driven. I agree to that, even in US, Europe, Malaysia. And those with DBAs tend to position themselves better in industry. So a person with PhD, very seldom you would find them uh, in industries. They are the rare breed, like five, ten percent. But people with DBA, you'll find most of the time. I am doing a DBA because I want that qualification, but uh, I want to be an industry leader. So you will find them. In that. So there's some differences. Generally, I'm not saying it's true all the time, yeah. But generally, there's one. Your positioning either industry or your positioning as an academician. And the uh, the other difference from a research perspective, you will find DBA. We kind of encourage the DBA candidates to work on more industry-driven projects. So it's not totally theoretical, 
how they mix theory with coming up with very practical solutions, either for the organization or for the industry that they belong to, to ensure they come up with meaningful contribution. As opposed to the PhD, you will find that it's more focused on your theoretical sort of contribution yeah, to advance knowledge in your domain area. So there will be some of the differences in that sense. Okay, thank you. Chin's uh, question. Yes, uh, I have one more question here from uh, Anna. Is postgraduate okay. degree recommended to a person who is about to retire? Interesting question. Thanks for the question, Anna. My, let me share a personal story. When I went for, when I went to the US, I was a Fulbright scholar. I was invited by the US. Department of State and the Fulbright Foundation to do a PhD in the US. So I went to US and I signed up for a PhD. My age was 31 at the time, yeah, 31. I felt I was old uh, <laughs> at, at the age of 31 to do a PhD because I thought I should have done it a long time ago. Some of my peers had done it when they were, after they finished their masters, they went on to, to do a PhD, but I spent some time in the industry. But guess what? One of the persons that I met, who signed up for PhD, he started at the age of 71. 71, eh? not 17. He started at the age of 71. So a person who is 40 years older than me signed up for PhD and we finished the same time. So when I asked this guy, why are you doing a PhD at 71? You know what was his response? He said, my desire to learn never dies. I, I, he said, till the day I die, I want to learn. And reading, thinking, writing prevents me from getting Alzheimer's. Yeah, so that's another way he looked at it. So people look at things differently. So he started at 71, 40 years older than me. I was 31 and finishing, we're writing a PhD together and it's finishing on the same time. That's one. Another person that I met was age 57. He was a database administrator, 30 years of database administration. We were very good friends. His name is John Steger. I still keep in touch with him, American. Um, we were on the same PhD class. He was 57 in this page. He said, John, why are you doing a PhD at 57? Aren't you a very senior database administrator? He said, yes, but technology is changing. I need to do more research in this field to advance myself and, and, and the company that I work for. Um, so to answer Anna's question, it's never too late for someone to do a postgraduate program when they're about to retire. In fact, two or three years for those who are in that mode where you are going to retire, say, five years towards retirement, Best time to do your postgraduate because post retirement you need to have backup plan. <laughs> What's your backup plan? Do you want to teach part time somewhere? You need that masters. Do you want to teach uh, full time somewhere? You need PhD. Or you don't teach? You want you want to supervise students uh, who are doing research? You need your PhD. Yeah. So in in that sense, it's never too late to start uh, a PG program because the learning continues and the journey continues. Thanks, Anna, for the question. All right, thank you. Um, now it's time for us to wrap up our session today. Thank you, Prof. Murari. And also thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And if you have any questions, you know, do contact us and also visit us at our open day today and tomorrow um, until 5 p.m. We are going to have our next session with the topic of Pulse of FinTech 2022, Protection and Trends at 2.30 p.m. Stay tuned. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.